While Donald Trump has been busy dining with a Holocaust denier and a rapper who mused about death for Jewish people, he was able to find time in his PAC schedule to support the non-governor of Arizona, Carrie Lake. The state's gubernatorial race has already been projected for Democrat Katie Hobbs, but that didn't stop the former president from posting, this is yet another criminal voting operation. So obvious, Carrie Lake should be installed governor of Arizona. This is almost as bad as the 2020 presidential election. Yes, he said, installed. And of course, longtime election denier Carrie Lake has yet to concede. She's one of 12 election denying candidates who lost their races for governor, according to an NBC News tally. And that's great. But don't lose sight of the fact that five election denying nominees for governor won, plus another 165 candidates when you add the secretary of state, Senate and House races nationwide. That's still a pretty scary number, especially when you consider that even Republicans who accept the outcome of 2020 are still working to undermine voting rights with a lot of help from the U.S. Supreme Court. And every effort to protect voting rights in Congress has failed, largely because of this Democratic senator, Kirsten Sinema of Arizona. As long as I've been doing this show, I have been complaining about Senator Sinema, whether she's refusing to speak with the press and slamming doors in NBC reporters' faces or voting thumbs down to raising the minimum wage or wearing an F off ring in an odd attempt to look like a maverick. She's been a pebble in the Democratic shoe since day one of the Biden presidency, especially when she defends the filibuster, a Jim Crow relic that's hobbling Congress. Eliminating the 60 vote threshold on a party line with the thinnest of possible majorities to pass these bills that I support will not guarantee that we prevent demagogues from winning office. Rather, eliminating the 60 vote threshold will simply guarantee that we lose a critical tool that we need to safeguard our democracy from threats in the years to come. No, the filibuster is what's helping the Republican Party destroy democracy. Cinema, in my opinion, has been abusing her position as a swing vote, a swing senator, throwing her weight around in a 50-50 Senate to stall the Democratic Party's agenda at every turn. Before the midterm elections, the Senate was split, down the middle, 50-50. That meant that the Democrats needed every single one of their senators to vote together with Vice President Kamala Harris then acting as the tiebreaker in order to get anything passed. So by threatening to defect, by threatening not to vote with her party, Kirsten Sinema, as well as Senator Joe Manchin of West Virginia, could hold any Democratic Party legislation hostage, including the aforementioned Freedom to Vote Act and John Lewis Voting Rights Act, those two very important bills. But the Arizona senators sway over her party in the Senate may be coming to an end because of the Senate runoff in Georgia. That's right. If Raphael Warnock defeats Herschel Walker in the runoff, Democrats will then have 51 senators to the Republican Party's 49. So instead of having to beg both Joe Manchin and Kirsten Sinema for support all the time, Democrats will only need one of them. And while they're both up for re-election in 2024, only one of the two, Kirsten Sinema, is running in an increasingly purple state. Polls from earlier this year showed grassroots Democrats in Arizona are not happy with her either. So even without a Warnock win, Cinema might need to play a little nicer with her Democratic colleagues in D.C. in order to boost her support with the party base back home in Arizona. Otherwise, she is going to face a grueling primary come 2024. And let's be honest, she deserves to. Joining me now, Arizona Democratic Congressman Ruben Gallego. He's also the chairman of Bold Pack, a group focused on bringing diverse leaders to Congress. Congressman, thanks for coming back on the show. There were clearly some big defeats in the midterms for GOP election deniers. But does that really mean Democrats can kind of sit back and relax now about democracy ahead of 2024? I mean, at least 170 election deniers won their House, Senate, Secretary of State or governor's races. That is still a lot. No, you really can't sit back because you still have the head of the Republican Party, which unfortunately is, you know, one of the major parties of two major parties that is still an election denier, is still pushing election denialism and is going to run in 2024 with other friends that are also election deniers. So, no, we can't let our foot off the gas. Um, we never have here in Arizona. That's why you saw such good results from here in Democrats. Uh, in Arizona, we saw the threats. We've seen the threats for quite a while, and we motivated people to come on vote, and not just Democrats, independents, and a lot of crossover Republicans that said we were not going to help some of these election deniers win uh, the, their offices this year. So 
Senate Democrats have tried to counter what the Republicans are doing on election subversion and voting rights and voter suppression in the wake of 2020. But a real obstacle since then for Democrats has been your Arizona colleague Kirsten Sinema. So let me ask you this. Should she face a primary challenge come 2024? And should that primary challenger be you? Well, in terms of what I'm going to do, I've said many times, I'm going to start making that decision in 2023. I committed myself to 2022 to making sure that Arizona had the best results for Democrats and for democracy in general. I feel that I've fulfilled that. Uh, I think the people of Arizona have been very loud and clear, both Democrats and independents and, and lots of Republicans, may, but for different reasons, that they're unhappy with, with Senator Sinema. Uh, and so she'll have to answer to them. Uh, I'll have my answer uh, in 2023. So the next Congress will have the largest number of Hispanics ever, 35 Democrats, 11 Republicans. Um, Democrats did well on that front. But the party is still continuing to lose its lead among Hispanic and Latino voters more broadly. They had a 40-point lead over Republicans in 2018, which is now down to 21 points among Latino voters. Why are Democrats still losing so much ground with this key constituency? Well, number one, you're basing that off an exit poll. Exit polls are notoriously uh, horrible when it comes to, uh, you know, being able to gauge Latino support. Uh, if we look at what actually happened at the ground level, except for Florida, Latinos actually were able to hit their 2018, 2020 numbers. Uh, and I think we're going to continue doing it. I think actually the reverse is going to happen. We're going to start doing a lot better in the future because the Democratic Party has woken up. They have realized that Latinos cannot be a population you can just take advantage of, uh, and that if you put enough effort and enough investment in, uh, you will have some great results. And this is why we didn't just win in Latino majority districts. We won in a lot of districts where there were very few Latino voters, but we ran some great candidates that were able to have great crossover appeal uh, and you know, won in areas they weren't supposed to win, Washington State. Uh, southern New Mexico, uh, Colorado, these places are places that have been very hostile to getting uh, Latinos elected, and we won, uh, and we will continue to win going into the future. So the current House Republican leader, Kevin McCarthy, we'll see if he actually becomes speaker in the end. Uh, he <laughs> said that his plan is for Republicans to read, quote, every single word of the Constitution on the House floor on the first day of the new Congress. Every single word. Uh, when Republicans have done this stunt before, they at least were wise enough to admit reading the three-fifths clause out loud. What, what are these gimmicks? Well, look, this is what they're going to do for the next two years. It's just a series of gimmicks and, uh, you know, tribunals, essentially, because they they don't have solutions. They're not going to be able to govern unless they just kind of give more bread and, bread and circuses to their own party, specifically the Marjorie Taylor Greens, Lauren Boberts of the world. They have no solution to help bring down inflation. They have no solution to actually help health care uh, be cheaper and more affordable. Uh, if anything, they're going to try to make it worse. Uh, so what they're going to do is do these types of gimmicks. And the problem is not that they're reading the Constitution, I, you know, all for that. The problem with someone like Kevin is that he doesn't under, actually understand the Constitution. Uh, and that's kind of the bigger problem here is they, they, it's all lip service. But when they, look, when they look at it, they don't really care what it actually means and the protections that, that, the, yes. that the Constitution gives many of us. A reminder to our viewers at home that Kevin McCarthy is, of course, an election denier himself who voted to overturn the election, even in the wake of January the 6th. Uh, Congressman, I want to get your reaction to a new ad from Democrat Raphael Warnock ahead of Georgia's runoff uh, Senate election. Have a watch a part of it. So I've been telling this little story about this bull out in the field. What on cow. earth? And three of them are pregnant. There's no substance. There's nothing. So you know you got something going on. It makes me want to laugh. And then it makes me think we're in trouble. But all he cared about is kept his nose against the fence, looking at three other cows that then belonged to him. Now all he had to do is eat grass. This video is ridiculous. I asked 35 seconds of my life I'll never get back. Why would I want someone like that leading the state of Georgia? It's a great ad, Congressman, highlighting the ridiculous candidacy of Herschel Walker and his manifest unfitness for high office. But I have to ask, where has that messaging been for the last few months? Raphael Warnock did not do that at the debates. And I feel like it's a broader problem for your party that, you know, people like yourself, Eric Swalwell, Ilhan Omar, a handful of others are willing to go kind of toe to toe, be a bit aggressive in your messaging. But most of your fellow Democrats don't. Well, look, uh, Raphael Warnock turned a state uh, blue that we never thought would have happened in 2020 of all elections. So we know he knows how to win. 
Uh, maybe they switch tactics because this is the time to do it and it's a different electorate. I'm not a Georgia expert, so I'm not going to counter what uh, this man has done being able to win Georgia as often as he has. But it's always my experience that if you have the better quality candidate, you have the better message, you shouldn't be afraid to call out the less quality candidate uh, with the worst message that the other side has. And, and strength matters. There's a lot of voters that decide that they want to vote for something based on how confident and how strong the other side is and how strong their messaging yeah. is. And I think you're going to see that really pay off here uh, for Senator Warnock when he gets reelected. Quick last question on calling out. Joe Biden didn't say anything about Donald Trump's dinner with Kanye West and Nick Fuentes, the white supremacist. He said, you don't want to hear what I have to say. I do want to hear what the president has to say. I want to hear what you have to say. I want to hear what Democrats have to say about this. Well, first of all, you don't, I'm Latino. We don't invite anybody to our house unless you are, you know, basically part of our fam, right? And uh, when you're in our house, then you are considered, uh, you know, part of our family. And and I wouldn't allow anybody of that nature in my house. I wouldn't allow any white supremacists, uh, certainly and definitely an anti-Semite like that. And I'm talking about both Kanye and uh, uh, Nick Fuentes. Yes. So Donald Trump, by doing that, in my opinion, basically says in himself, especially because he doesn't denounce it, that he himself is a white supremacist, that he himself is an anti-Semite, and he should be ashamed of himself. Now, who should not also be ashamed for himself, for themselves, is the rest of the Republican Party. Donald Trump is going to protect himself because that's human nature. Yes. But the fact that the Republican Party has not come out and, set, and stood up and actually you know, yes. said something about Donald Trump inviting an anti-Semite and, and Kanye uh, and a white supremacist and the other little guy— uh, tells you a lot about who the Republican Party uh, is. And it, it's a yes, party it that needs that base to be part of their voting bloc. And that's why they're afraid uh, to call it out. And so let me tell you what I'm telling you right now. Donald Trump, you are a white supremacist and you should be ashamed of yourself.